we are off to ah, server. We are on the penultimate issue of Nintendo Power's ninth year, and we have a bunch more games to review this issue. Hell, in fact, we have a bunch of games to review. This issue is a big deal. The drought may, may, may be over. We are covering issue 95 for April of 1995. Let's get started. Our cover game this issue is Blast Core for the Nintendo 64. In the letters column, in the name of being witty for the sake of April Fool's Day, Nintendo Power gives snarky and utterly unrelated headers for each letter. Better than some things, I guess. In the Power Charts, we still have no new games, with Metroid 2 and Super Metroid returning for the Game Boy and Super NES, uh, respectively. I am still surprised it took as long as it did for the Metroid franchise to return to a Metroid console. Not necessarily surprised that it was on the it was from a Western developer for the GameCube, considering that by all accounts, Metroid has been always been a little more popular in the West than it was in Japan. But still, I'm surprised it took this long, especially considering the number of Japanese developers who are coming to the forefront, uh, or rather say, who are stepping away from the N64 and American developers coming to the forefront. To correct myself, there, our first game of the issue is our cover game Blast Core. We have the overall structure of the game at each difficulty level. The game does give general notes for each stage, including bonus stages, along with more specific notes on some of the stages in the earlier part of the game. In particular, showing the transports route through the stage and where bonuses are that you can collect once you initially clear out this, um, the stage. Now, Blast Core is a different form of puzzle game. The key to solving the game's puzzles is strictly based around, fig uh, based around figuring out how to effectively use the vehicles that you are given, and the different ways that they control, and how effectively they damage buildings to clear a path for the truck in the right amount of time. It is radically different from most of the puzzle concepts we've been into so far, whether they're block matching, um, color matching, block pushing, or what have you. Instead, this is all about uh, creative and inventive destruction. It's actually a game concept I haven't encountered that often. The Artful Escape did some stuff with this in terms of preparing your escape route and developing a clear path you can use once you start the escape sequence, but even then it doesn't work on quite the same level as this, as where this has different vehicles with different ha handling characteristics that blow crap up in different ways, which you have act with different ones you have access to on different levels, forcing you to manage your destruction using the tools provided. I love it. We have an interview with one of the developers of the next Clay Fighter game, um, getting into the next title for the N64, and oof, how can the sequel age worse than the original? Well, um, we have ableist slurs used in combo titles. We have racist caricatures used in character designs. I'm considering skipping this game on general principle once it comes out. I like, which is like, frankly, I got the, the, um, my flash cart, the ever drive for the N64 because, okay, I'm going to be playing hard to find games like this one, but oh crap. Like hopefully this changes for the, like, like Nintendo requires them to change this when this actually comes out because yeesh, like I reviewed earthworm Jim. And I knew that Doug Tennaple was a vile, misogynist, racist bigot at the time, but that but I was felt okay reviewing the game because that bigotry never was, was never surfaced in the game itself. There were no racist caricature character designs. Um, you didn't have characters actively throwing around slurs as part of the game mechanics or the game graphics when doing combos or what ha or power ups or what have you. This is very different, and I'm seriously considering skipping this game for that reason. On a much better note, we have an in-depth guide for Doom 64, where we can all feel comfortable agreeing that we can we are going to rip and tear until it is done. We now have level maps for the first 10 levels of the game, along with specific notes for each level. Doom 64 plays incredibly well, and it has most of the built-in controller configurations that you would want with the first-person shooter to a point that having 
previously learned what worked and didn't work for me with Turok, I was able to use a pre-mapped control scheme that handled exactly the way I wanted and played incredibly well without having to make any modifications at all. That is not to say the game is without its issues. The minor one being, or minor major, depending on how you want to look at it, is that when you die, you start the game level over with just a pistol, meaning that you lose any weapon pickups that you've gotten in previous levels. Considering the game saves weapon information to the memory card and with the password, it feels disappointing to lose stuff like finding the chainsaw in that way and having to take it to the next level only to die and not have the chainsaw anymore, or the super shotgun, or the chain gun, or what have you, as this could potentially cause a sort of equipment death spiral situation, sort of like uh, with, for example, Gradius and other similar um, shoot 'em ups back in the day. That said, this game feels like Doom in all the right ways. How the hitscan weapons work, not worrying about jumping and platforming as opposed to Turok, a dark and ominous atmosphere, going into a room, grabbing a key or hitting a switch or grabbing a weapon power up, and in the process, opening a whole bunch of monster closets that disgorge their contacts in the arena that you then have to deal with. They made, like, Midway made a Doom game that felt like proper Doom, even without being made on the same engine as the PC versions or its various ports for PlayStation or um, Super Nintendo or Jaguar or whatever, and had very little of the original team involved. Major props to, to Midway for this. In the classified information column, we have tips for a whole bunch of alternative costumes from Street Fighter Alpha 2, including unlocking... Uh, Chun-Li's Street Fighter 2 costume. Continuing with the theme of Nintendo Power starting to have a better grasp of having how to do maps for 3D games now, we have level maps for Turok Dinosaur Hunter. We'll see if they've consistently figured this out when GoldenEye 007 comes out. We have some additional strategies and general advice for Wayne Gretzky's 3D hockey. We have a preview for the upcoming 3D fighter Dark Rift for the N64. We have notes on each of the playable characters, but very little on game mechanics, and the art we have here is more concept art and early renders than the final project, so it's probably a ways off. There's an article on bug testing as a path into the game industry, which used to be a thing until companies started relying more on contractors as testers and closing options for them to be hired on full-time. Additionally, the article normalizes some heavy crunch, very heavy crunch, like describing 18-hour days as being normal, which is not okay. Um, speaking as a person who supports the efforts by game testers and um, at major companies like, you know, Blizzard or Activision Blizzard and Ubisoft and so forth to, you know, unionize. We have a map of Super Metroid, along with routing information to get through the game at what is, for 1995, described as the best possible time, or rather, sort of. Their part-time, however, is currently about twice that of the current any percent world record speedruns, so the tech has changed considerably since then. We have some returning coverage for Doom on the Super Nintendo, timely. Um, giving arguably complete level maps for the games. I say arguably because it's it's the maps from like when you hit the subscreen menu to see the full level map at your location. But there are no useful notes or annotations about things like switches, where the keys are, or, you know, secrets, which make them a little less useful. We have a couple Game Boy games for review, starting off with Kirby Star Stacker, uh, Falling block puzzle or raising block puzzle match game. It looks a little like Panel to Pawn, just for the Game Boy. Kirby Star Stacker handles the Panel to Pawn formula incredibly well, and honestly, as much as the main games in the series do the do an admirable job of easing players into the game mechanics of platformers, Star Stacker does a similar job of easing players into setting up combos in Panel to Pawn with the simple like like normal mode giving a whole bunch of really heavy tips in terms of block placement and that sort of thing um 
and thus in turn from there setting up big combos and giving you an idea of okay so here's what i need to look for at the higher difficulties and then in turn allowing me to take that knowledge to stuff like poyo like panel de pawn and so on to impact how i handle playing those games hopefully um makes me more successful there rather nice our last game of the issue is the Game & Watch Gallery, a collection of adaptations of various of three Game & Watch titles with notes on each game. Playing a bunch of Game & Watch um, titles in a row, these three in particular, gets across one thing with the games in the series. <clears throat> At least these ones. They are all, fundamentally, based on the concept of spinning plates. Not literal, but metaphorical. Whether it's managing platforms, a landing pad, oil drips, or even to a lesser extent, handling the tentacles of the octopus. However, in spite of using the same general route for most of these games, they vary things up enough to keep those games engaging. That said, while competing to better your own score works well enough, it'd be nice if there was some way to compare scores. It would have been interesting to take advantage of the link cable technology and link cable support where you could link some Game Boy, a couple Game Boys, and then transfer whatever the highest scores were for each mode to the respective to whatever Game Boy didn't have those scores, providing theoretically an option to have a best score for your region kind of thing. See, he's got the best one for <clears throat> each title in Game & Watch. As battery backup technology becomes more widespread, this feels like something that would be more a, a reasonable thing to do, particularly as you start seeing Game Boy game related communities springing up in schools, especially once Pokemon starts coming out. But we're not there yet. In the counselor's corner, we have a bunch of animal husbandry advice for Harvest Moon. In the beat for the boss column, we have a bunch of one off final boss fights for various games. Still no Rans, still no still know also Rans in the now playing column. And in Pack Watch, we have a look at Kurt Yoshi's Island 64 and more on Star Fox 64. So this is an interesting pick to handle this issue. Because each of the N64 games we've had are also ones that have recently gotten a remake or re-release. Last Core 64 was re-released as part of the Rare Replay, replay Collection on Xbox consoles. Um, Xbox uh, um, One and the also the Xbox um, series of the Xbox series series of consoles um, is available through there, which means also I believe on PC Game Pass. And Doom sixty four has also been released on its own, both of which would potentially for both of them mitigate some of the eccentricities of the N sixty four controller if those are giving you problems in terms of the controls, particularly in the case of Doom because you get to use mouse and keyboard. As Lord Carmack, as the Lords Carmack and Romero intended. Um, also, oddly enough, both of them are now also tied to Microsoft because of the Bethesda purchase being purchased by Microsoft. Weird how things have changed. Indeed, I would be inclined to pick those up for a different reason. As for each of those games, because I am playing on original hardware, um, or possibly because I'm I'm playing on original hardware, I should put that asterisk on there. I encountered a degree of motion sickness. Now for Doom 64, this is something I am used to for first-person shooters. First-person shooters of this particular vintage and I, I, I end up running into motion sickness issues and having cert have certain limitations for how long it can play. Um, in one sitting before I gotta stop, walk away, and do something else, and let my um, ear, ears basically kind of reacquaint themselves. Um, it happens with... Like, this isn't just a Doom 64 thing. This isn't just a Turok thing. This isn't just a first-person shooters in the N64 thing. Original Doom gives me this problem, even on PC. Uh, Quake. Um, I really haven't played the remake, but original Quake gave me this problem uh, uh, when I played that. Um, Quake 2, to a lesser extent, but still somewhat. Um, less so now with modern first-person shooters. So... But yeah, it's, it's a thing I am used to. I suspect it has to do with the speed that your character is moving at, um, along with head bob and a bunch of other factors. But yeah, again, first-person series of a certain spinach, 
I have to I have to be careful how much I watch it. Whenever a Doom run comes up on Games Done Quick, I kind of guess gotta watch it out of my peripheral vision and can't focus on it. Uh, it's it's a problem. Last score, on the other hand, was surprising. And that I think it's I don't know if it's a frame rate issue or something else, because that's a third person game. It does get up close for the camera perspective, but it's still not necessarily like it, it's not first person. I wonder if this is a case of camera distance or something else going on that's causing the problem there. But in any case, that may be resolved in the Rare Replay collection instead of playing on original hardware. I will have to check that on my own time and get back and try to remember to get back to you on that. Now, next issue, we will wrap up year nine with the results of the Nintendo Power Rewards. But before we end this issue and this episode, I do have one bit of in serious real world intrusion to get into. When I did my lead in videos for the Nintendo Power Perspectives for the N64, I mentioned that for this portion that we're entering, um, when I started doing N64 games, I would be able to use original hardware. And that part of the reason I was able to do this is because of using the latest model of the EverDrive N64, created by Riz. Um, so it here is, uh, who was based out of rain. As of this recording in March, thankfully, uh, at the middle of March, he is safe and out of the country. This video is going up at the tail end of April. Um, this is the, this is the, the curse of trying to have a buffer in case of emergencies like wildfires a couple years ago, um, is you then a situation where you I can't pretend how things are going to be in Ukraine then. I can't pretend to know. I can't say in any way. Um, if I could, I'd be... If I could see the future in that regard, or in other regards, I could I could do that for tremendous... Use it for tremendous amounts of good, but I, I cannot. Maybe the Russians will have withdrawn. Maybe they won't. Maybe fighting will still be ongoing. Maybe there'll be a ceasefire. Maybe there'll be a ceasefire and ongoing fighting. Um, the Russian military has shown no qualms against shoving, shelling refugee evacuation corridors and even hospitals. What I know is this. No matter what happens, no matter where we are at the uh, start of, or the tail end of April, people of Ukraine are going to need help. And even if you're like looking at the developers of the stalker games posting a routing uh account and routing number to send money straight to or a transfer number to send money straight to another to the ukrainian military even if that's not comfortable to you um there are other ways that you can help the citizens on the ground directly on the ground in ukraine and also refugees outside of Ukraine. show notes for this video will have links uh to several nonprofits that are helping out. Um, Doctors Without Borders, Sunflowers for Peace, the UN Refugee Agency, and UNICEF. All of them will have links in the doobly-doo below. I know that the new YouTube interface kind of buries that a little bit, so please click the little thing to expand it. If you have money to spare, please donate. Um, if you don't have the money to spare, please pass the links along to your friends find someone who, or someone who is. Uh, and also, if you are employed, um, please consider asking your employer if they have a matching program to extend and expand the impact of your donation. One other thing, so this is a thing that's been going on as of this recording, may not be as much of a thing when this comes out, but still. You're a scalper out there with a big selling off your stock of EverDrives at a huge markup for like $1,000 for a, a Super Nintendo EverDrive or an N64 EverDrive or whatever. And if you don't want to come across like a total asshole, just my thought, maybe take in some of that uh, markup that you're doing and do some good with it. Maybe donate some of that to those organizations I mentioned, mentioned earlier. Do some good to help out the people of Ukraine, those, those who are in a war zone and those who are refugees and trying to find a way to get by far from home.
thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any f future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.